So welcome to a walk in the park with Animal Friends. Today we've got Charlie with us from Tusk. So Charlie, can you give our listeners a quick overview of who you are and what you do at Tusk? Well, thank you so much. And it's a great honour to be invited to, to do this podcast and a great thrill to be here. So thank you for that. Um, I am, uh, for my sins, the chief executive and founder of Tusk, uh, which I established uh, back in 1990 so just over three decades ago. Um, and the, the charity basically is focused on the conservation of Africa's wildlife and its wild habitats. Mm-hmm. Um, and we do so uh, very much in conjunction with community development and education. So that's, you know, in a nutshell, what, what the organization does. Um, but I, I, I set the charity up really at the height of the ivory trade, um, which during the 80s, we were losing something like 100,000 elephants a year yeah. to the ivory trade. So that was really the stimulus for, for establishing the charity. Um, but right from the word go, the, the charity has been focused on all of Africa's wildlife. So not just tusked animals. Yeah. We have a portfolio of projects right across the African continent that's covering a whole spectrum of species from gorillas to turtles to to wild dog uh, and everything in between. Lovely. And what sparked that passion for conservation right at the beginning? Well, I was lucky enough uh, to travel to South Africa initially in my as part of my gap year. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, nothing to do with conservation at all. I ended up selling, uh, being a traveling salesman, selling big barrows and stationery around the industrial estates of Johannesburg. But during the weekends, I had the opportunity to get out and, and get into some of the, the, the African bush. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was what sort of whet my appetite to, to explore more of the continent. And when I came back from that trip, I ended up in the city, in the insurance world, um, coincidentally, um, working as a marine insurance broker uh, in Lloyd's. Um, but all I really wanted to do was explore more of Africa. So I, I persuaded uh, Willis Faber, who I was working for at the time, to sponsor me to take an expedition. We drove over a period of seven months from London to Cape Town. Amazing. And in order to try and justify that trip, um, we undertook a few projects. Mm-hmm one of which was to help establish a new rhino sanctuary in Kenya, uh, in the the Rift Valley, in a Mm. place called Lake Nakuru National Park. And so so it was really during that experience that I became aware of the issues that were facing African wildlife, particularly elephant and rhino, that were being decimated by the poaching for the illegal wildlife trade. And and I made a, a... a fly on the wall documentary for Channel Four about the expedition, and after coming back from the trip, um, you know, friends of mine said, "Well, you should, you should do more and try and uh, highlight uh, the crisis in, in conservation." Um, and so that really ultimately led to setting up Tusk in 1990. And crikey, haven't you gone and done more? So we touched on it earlier that Tusk uh, really look at a diverse range of projects out in Africa. Do you want to, I know you mentioned a couple of them, but should we dig a little bit deeper into some of those uh, that you've been working on more recently? So what one kind of springs to mind first for you? Do you know um, what became very evident uh, very early on uh, in the charity's um, journey was that the future of Africa's wildlife is really totally dependent on the relationship with the people that coexist with it, live alongside it. And so uh, we were uh, one of the earlier charities to get behind community-led, community-driven conservation. And so um, you know, a significant proportion of the investment that we put into wildlife conservation across Africa uh, has a very strong human dimension to it. Mm -hmm. Um, And one of the things I think I'm probably most proud of is that, uh, you know, in the mid-90s, we uh, started investing in the establishment of 
community managed conservancies in northern Kenya. Okay. And that uh, that led to ultimately to then the establishment of an organization, an umbrella organization called the Northern Rangers Trust, uh, that is now looking after 43 conservancies wow. covering a vast landscape. I can't mm. remember the, the figures, but it's millions of acres of community owned and managed land that has basically adopted a common conservation policy. And, and this is an area of, of northern Kenya that in the 80s and 90s was, was frankly pretty insecure. It was, mm -hmm. was, was overrun with Somali poachers who are heavily armed bandits that terrorized the people living in that area. Um, and were not only after the ivory, but they were stealing the cattle, so there was a huge impact on those communities mm. and their livelihoods. So, uh, and what's been really exciting is how um, the transition to these community conservancies has has led to an incredible sort of economic upliftment of those communities, and more importantly, from our perspective, has created the security across a vast landscape for wildlife in that area mm. and when you take into account that in a country like Kenya between 60 and 70 percent of its wildlife lives outside national parks those community conservancies are vital absolutely so when you're working with the communities obviously there's a an education piece to it but what else do those programs then start to look like how do you really get the communities involved in that conservation the key to to all of this is to uh, demonstrate to the communities that conservation uh, can be a tool to um, uh, improve their livelihoods mm -hmm. through, uh, well, in, in that northern Kenyan case, uh, security. But once you've got security in place, uh, and by the way, the, uh, implementing security meant employing the local people and training them up, mm -hmm. so they gave them jobs uh, as rangers. Um, but once you've got security in place, then you could attract tourism. Mm -hmm. And the, the wildlife in that, again, you know, what's amazing about uh, wildlife is that how well it responds to security, particularly elephants are incredibly mm -hmm. intelligent creatures. So they responded to that security, recognized that security. And so they would then uh, return to that area and, and, and hang about, which then gives you a tourism product. Yes. And so from the tourism product, you then generate even greater employment. And in one conservancy, one of the early conservancies we set up, um, they are now generating something like a quarter of a million dollars of a dividend going back into that community of 5,000 people. Uh, that's, a, that's a dividend that wasn't even there before. Yeah, and so vital as well. So let's. you've talked a lot about tourism there. So... Um, We've had a lot of conversation already in the, the podcast this season talking around responsible tourism. So what are the, some of the key things for people looking to go out to Africa to experience safari? What are some of the key things that they really need to be looking out for to make sure that they are going with somebody who's responsible and thinking about the conservation and not um, impacting the animals in their daily lives? I think the first thing to say is that tourism is immensely valuable mm -hmm. to Africa. Um, and, you know, we saw through the pandemic the devastating impact of tourism just falling off a cliff. Um, maybe we can come back to that. Mm. But um, uh, so responsible tourism, absolutely, you're so right. It's, it's incredibly important that uh, when people go to Africa, that uh, they respect the environment, they respect the culture uh, of the people that they're with. Um, and the crucial thing, one of the really crucial things is, unfortunately, in some places, some, some of the parks you go to, you see how the standards of um, safari game drives are not being upheld. And, you know, classic example is a pride of lion you know is spotted by a safari guide and, and jeep and 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 within within minutes you've got you know 10 minibuses 
surrounding that pride no. and that is absolutely appalling and mm. and so uh, there are lots of efforts you know to try and really educate the safari guides and the drivers um you know about how it's so important that that you know that we don't harass these animals um and that uh you know so so upholding the standards you know and it most of it's common sense at the end of the day um but um we you know we're a great supporter of uh of these uh community lodges mm-hmm. um it goes back to what i was saying earlier in terms of of really just trying to use conservation and and wildlife tourism as a as a tool to improve livelihoods and economic uh outlook for the for these communities and a lot of these you know there is now a number of community lodges that have sprung up which are quite small so probably only 16 beds mm-hmm. so low impact uh you know this is not about mass tourism uh, it's low impact and and uh, you know got a high profit margin uh, and that's the sort of tourism that we we certainly prefer but you know i recognize that that is is also you know not everybody can afford that mm. and so when you look at the mass market tourism particularly places like the Masai Mara or Savo National Park in Kenya or the Kruger National Park mm-hmm. in South Africa or whatever is that you know that's where you you need the the owners and the managers of the lodges and the people that the control the drivers and the guides to really implement a very strong uh, standard code of, of practice. Yes. So we've talked uh, about safaris there. What about some of the other attractions that you might see? Uh, I've seen it in Asia, not so much maybe in Africa, but you, you might tell me differently around kind of elephant riding or lion cub petting and stuff like that. Um, obviously, these seem quite attractive to people, but they're hugely harmful for those animals, right? Do you see a lot of that in Africa? Actually, thankfully, no, Good. we don't see a lot of it. Um, I, I, I'm aware of certainly the, and I don't know whether they're still operating. There was a um, an organisation or a, a company in Botswana that had elephant back safaris. Mm. I don't know whether that's still operating. To be honest with you. Um, it was very, very small, and it was incredibly high-priced anyway. So, uh, you know, in that sense, it was definitely not mass tourism. Um, but, no, we, 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 we don't want to encourage that sort of thing. Uh, and, um, you know, there is a, I think, sadly, there is a bit of a practice in southern Africa where you get, um, you know, lions being bred and the cubs are then used as a, uh, as an attraction mm. uh, and I think that is just awful yeah no I agree so moving back to the human wildlife conflict I know that that Tusk do a huge amount of work in that space do you want to talk around some of the the unique projects that you've been involved in to to help manage that conflict yeah I mean you know um, human wildlife conflict is probably um, the biggest challenge facing conservation going forward mm. um you know, when I set up Tusk uh, back in 1990, um, the big issue was the illegal wildlife trade mm-hmm. and, and poaching. Um, but today, really, uh, uh, it's issues around human wildlife conflict, which has been brought about through loss of habitat mm-hmm. and the fact that we are our own human footprint uh, is is growing at such a rate and in Africa its population is is set to double by 2050 um, that um, the you know you've just got this constant uh, pressure on land and therefore on wildlife bringing the communities that live alongside that wildlife into increasing conflict so um, but what's interesting is is has been how Technology mm-hmm. and uh, a raft of innovative ideas have have to been developed to try and mitigate that conflict. So, um, for instance, with elephants, mm-hmm. 
obviously a huge animal. Yes. Um, can be incredibly destructive. Um, uh, and, you know, overnight can walk into someone's farm and eat all their crops, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so uh, there are various things which um, uh, we've discovered about elephants, which is one, that they don't like bees. <laughs> so hold on. A massive, massive animal doesn't like tiny bees. Yeah. Well, the African bee has a really, uh, a, a, you know, punchy sting. Okay. And um, so uh, there's a lady, lady called uh, Lucy King who's developed a, a brilliant initiative which has now been rolled out across lots of Af- you know, parts of Africa um, where um, hanging beehives on uh, strands of wire fencing mm-hmm. around a farm um, and the first thing is that if the elephant approaches uh, that farm, you know, perhaps smell, smelt the crop and thinking, yum, I'm going to go in for mm-hmm. that. But then he, he or she will then hear the bees in the beehive. So that's the first deterrent. Mm-hmm. Um, now, if he's still determined to keep going, if he then knocks into that fence, anywhere on that fence, yep. it shakes the beehive. The hive, yeah. And the bees come rushing out and look for whatever it is that, that has disturbed them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, is likely to then go and attack the elephant. And they get stung sort of behind the ear in the soft part of their skin. Mm-hmm. And they don't like it. Um, so uh, these beehive fences have been very effective. And, of course, the additional benefit is that they produce honey. Yep. For the farmer. So the farmer gets an additional income from selling the honey from the beehive fences. What an innovative way to help use nature to manage nature, but also not just the honey piece, but there'll be the, the cross-pollination piece for the crops. And exactly. It's just such a wonderful way to be able to help manage that conflict. But who knew that, that exactly. the elephants didn't like bees? They don't like chili either. Chili. So, so another initiative has been growing chili hedges, okay, or uh, creating chili briquettes that they can burn, and the smell from the smoke of those briquettes burning uh, will also deter um, elephants. Another another great one which I love is is down in Botswana. We're supporting a project called Claws, where they've um, using the latest technology to with lions Mm -hmm. whereby uh using a collar putting a collar on a on a lion the lion uh sends a text message to the farmer to the livestock farmer to warn them that they are that they're nearby they're nearby and they're coming their way um now of course the thing about that is that not every farmer in some of these areas are able to read Mm-hmm. So if, if the farmer has registered with the program and says, I'm sorry, I can't read, so a text message isn't going to be no good to me, uh, the software knows that for that particular farmer to send a voicemail. Okay. And the voicemail comes from the lion, and they all know the names of the the The, the, the lions are all named. So they'll say, you know, I don't know, Simba is, is coming, you know, yeah. is coming, I'm 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 five miles away or whatever um and that has reduced the incidence of land conflict amongst those livestock farmers so how do those farmers then go and help deter the lions obviously they're awake they know that they need to get up to protect the the stock but then how do they then help manage that situation so the main and the main uh, thing is that they, they then will bring their cattle in uh, to bomas and okay. uh, you know there's an additional uh, initiative to um, help the farmers to improve the the uh, uh, the way they create and construct those bomas so that mm-hmm. they are truly predator proof. Because uh, that for years has been a problem is that the bomas, you know, aren't really predator proof and the lions come along at night and, and, you know, just jump in. Yeah. Cause havoc. Okay. There's, uh, I, and what I love is the, using that innovation. Although, to be fair, I was going, if they can't read, are you sending a little line emoji to tell them they're on the way? But a voicemail uh, makes way more sense. So uh, Lions is obviously another key uh, project that you you work on. I know uh, last year, 
year before crikey i can't remember which year but we were involved in the lion trail which was a huge success uh for tus not just for the the money that it raised to support the amazing work that you do but also raising visibility of lions and and the support that they need do you want to tell us a little bit more yes. about those lions so so the reason we did the lion trail we'd, we'd previously done the rhino trail which mm-hmm. you'd also supported very generously um so uh what a lot of people haven't really um taken note of yet sadly is that lions are in dire trouble mm-hmm. um the african lion population is now less than twenty five thousand, possibly as low as twenty thousand uh in the wild today in africa that makes them actually rarer than the rhino in Africa and they are under real pressure Mm -hmm. so we did the the lion trail which was a sculpture trail we had uh, 43 lion sculptures I think it was or 46 can't remember um, around eight cities around the world yes it went global it went global and it was fantastic uh, and I think uh, ultimately you know raised something like two million dollars um for our lion programs um so um th- those sculptures were painted by um you know a raft of fantastic artists and celebrities uh went on display you know in the, these various cities around the world uh we had a huge number in london um and um ultimately then were sold at auction Yep. So and I think you've got one or two here We've got in the it. office. We de- definitely have a couple here. Maybe we can add some pictures. <laughs> um, what are the key? What is the key thing that's driving down the populations of lions? I'm sure it's multiple things, but yeah. So so lions are now um, really being squeezed out of their natural habitat mm-hmm. and uh, natural territory. So uh, they now exist in less than eight percent of their historic rangelands across Africa um, I mean obviously you know lions come into conflict with humans um, and with livestock mm-hmm. so they've been persecuted you know for decades in that respect um, uh, so the combination of, of that conflict and loss of habitat has been the main cause but really sadly and it is that what's also exacerbated the situation has been a growing trade in lion parts. So lions are being poached, um, you know, for Far Eastern markets uh, and um, possibly because, you know, the fact that the tiger trade, Mm. you know, uh, that there are so few tigers now left in the world that maybe those markets started to look for, you know, and other species, mm. and, and the lions seem to fit the bill, sadly. So it's it's just awful. Um, and for such a majestic animal like the lion, which yeah. is sort of the king of the jungle, to think that is now really on the brink of extinction mm. um, is is very, very sad indeed. And, and it's something we just, we can't let happen. Yeah, it's, that's absolutely heartbreaking to understand their population is in in dire straits at the moment if our listeners could do anything today if they're feeling moved by what you're talking about from a lion perspective what are some of the key things that they might be able to do to help you won't be surprised me saying you know <laughs> donate some yeah, funds absolutely. Uh, you know there's very little that individuals can do you know uh, outside Africa, if you like, mm. to uh, other than to to support the the lion conservation programs that that are underway, um, and there are a number of extremely good organisations that we work with on the ground um, who are doing fantastic work. You know, the thing about lions is that given the opportunity, their population could bounce back. You know, they they breed well. Yeah. Um, so, um, but it is about securing landscape for mm-hmm. them, as it is for all of wildlife. You know, it's ultimately all goes back to landscape and, and habitat. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah. again, as the, an apex predator, they're going to play a huge vital part of the ecosystem as well. So are, are you seeing a lot of the effect of their numbers dwindling on the wider ecosystems as well? Uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, as you say, they're an apex predator. Um, and 
you know, they're important in keeping nature in balance. Mm. You know, uh, every species on this planet is there for a reason. We're yeah. all part of a big jigsaw. Mm. And uh, and that's the, the great tragedy is that as we keep on, um, you know, pulling, you know, taking pieces out of that jigsaw away, you know, the, the whole sort of... Uh, um, fragment of life sort of breaks down yeah. and and that's the danger i think that you know we have to understand that you know all of these species um fauna and flora you know they're all part of the biodiversity mm. and and a functioning ecosystem that um that ultimately we all depend on and you know we we've just got to stop being so incredibly arrogant as as a human species to think that we can exist on this planet without biodiversity we can't every breath of air we take every mouthful of food we eat and every drink we take relies on nature mm. oh, i couldn't agree more and charlie i could talk about lions uh, all day but if we move on to um the success that you had with the lion trail you're now launching a trail on gorillas so do you want to tell us a bit more about that yeah no we got a fantastic gorilla trail it's um um in fact i think when the, when this podcast go out it goes out sadly i think the gorillas might be off the streets by then but but um uh but we've done a similar thing as we've done with the rhino and the, mm -hmm. and the lion not not quite as big we've got uh 15 gorillas um that will be um uh, they're on display in Covent Garden okay. um, and then they will be auctioned off uh, in November um, to raise funds, you know, for uh, gorilla conservation um, and and the wider work that Tusk does. Um, so um, I've actually been very fortunate. I've just come back from visiting uh, a mountain gorilla project that we've been supporting for many years in Uganda. And it just reminded me how amazing the gorillas are yeah i mean they they are as you know i'm sure you know everyone knows that you know they are so close to our own dna mm. and when you sit down with a family of gorillas and and look them in the eye you know you just get a very strong sense of how human they are yeah. you know they are reading your mind as much as you are theirs yeah. um and uh it's a huge privilege to to see them in the wild but they are like a lot of you know these megafauna under real pressure again mm. through loss of habitat loss primarily of habitat. and is uh poaching still key for for gorilla populations as well or is that has that slowed down I, I i'd actually say Poaching for gorillas is not such a major issue. Mm -hmm. uh, that certainly has been um, a problem. Um, the bushmeat trade tends to focus more on chimpanzees and okay. other monkeys uh, more than uh, than gorillas. Yeah. However, you know the mountain gorilla, which exists in uh, a very small area. Uh, the Virungas and on the uh, sort of if between the borders of the DRC, Rwanda and Uganda um, it is a, the, again, it's just a loss of habitat, the loss of forest, the, the, the chopping down of the forest, you know, that has been incessant over such a long period of time mm -hmm. has just squeezed this population to smaller and smaller areas and, you know, uh, and has led to conflict. You know, so again, farmers, mm -hmm. you know, they 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 bump into a gorilla. If the gorilla attacks them, you know, they obviously defend themselves. They'll yeah. kill it. Um, or they've put snares in the forest, not with a view to catching a gorilla. Yeah. But if inadvertently they do catch a gorilla in a snare and when they come back to collect what they hope might be a small antelope or something like that. Mm they find an enormous gorilla that's still alive in the snare. You know, they, they've they got no choice but to kill a gorilla. So, um, you know, these are the, these are the issues mm. facing gorillas. Gorillas are also, because they're so close to, to humans, are susceptible to 
human disease. Okay. So um, one of the, uh, you know, the project that we support in Uganda is very much focused around, it's called Conservation Through Public Health, and mm -hmm. it's very much focused on working with the communities that live immediately around the park uh, to improve their own health care and 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 well-being to reduce the incidence of um of that transfer those viruses yeah. or whatever transferring wow i had no idea just yeah i mean when you think about it it's quite logical if they're so close to us in a dna perspective but i would have no idea that they were as susceptible to human disease That's, yeah Oh. Yeah, and, and you know, just give an I, I mean, mountain gorilla conservation has actually been pretty successful in mm -hmm. recent years. Um, at at a low point, um, the mountain gorilla pro population was was something like six hundred animals only left. Uh, whereas when I was out there the other day, uh, they told me that we're up to one thousand and sixty three gorillas. And in how much time has it taken to repopulate to those numbers? Because you said with lions that they, they breed relatively quickly, so you we could, with the right support, help put numbers back in. But how long would that take for the gorilla population, do you think? Yeah, I mean, uh, gorillas probably don't, uh, don't reproduce at the same rate that lions do, mm -hmm. um, but um, nothing like, actually. But, um, uh, but that population turnaround has been... Really, over I'd say the last uh, fifteen, twenty years, um, from from its low point, um, and you know, is definitely a reflection of the conservation efforts that have been, you know, uh, put in place. Mm -hmm. um, now, that's the mountain gorilla. Mm -hmm. There are there's a you know there's a there's also a population of lowland gorilla, um, both an eastern lowland and the western lowland gorillas, and they are under pressure as well. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, and the, the, uh, you know, conservation in Central Africa, the Congo and places like that is not easy. You know, you've got, um, you know, the, the, the issues of political issues of, of you know, with armed guerrillas, mm. you know, of the human kind, mm -hmm. um, and, and rebel groups that are operating in these forests that make, it very difficult for conservationists and conservation to, you know, to work, and and also means that you know there's very little tourism that that can go in to underpin, you know, those um, lowland gorilla populations mm. uh, in in that part of the world. So, so the mountain gorilla is you know benefits from conservation and from tourism. Yeah. So, and you were saying that you you were out there just recently. I can only imagine just being able to look on relatively closely to them. That must be really magical to be able to just observe them, but also really realise that they're observing you at the same time. Oh, very much so. Um, uh, you know, it's very strictly controlled, I mm -hmm. should say, the tourism. So, so when you, it's expensive to do mm -hmm. um, because there are a limited number of uh, gorilla families that have been habituated to be able to uh, for tourists to go and see mm -hmm. and that they limit the number of uh, tourists uh, in any one day to, to eight people to go and visit any one family so you have an hour only an hour yeah. to be with that uh, gorilla family uh, to observe them um, and again strict you know regulations in place to to keep the distance between the gorilla and um, you know and the and the visitors mm. to it's something like eight meters. Now sometimes the gorillas don't observe that. You know they will come up. <laughs> you know, a baby will come up close. Yeah. Um, but again, it's all very much designed to try and uh, ensure that we are not transmitting yeah. any of our. Uh, disease or viruses or whatever to those populations so so it is very very strictly controlled um and, and very well done but it is uh it's one of those real bucket list moments yeah. when you sit down with a with a gorilla family yeah that sounds amazing i think that'll be added to my bucket list for sure so one of the other programs that we desperately wanted to talk to you about today you can see i'm wearing a, a pangolin t-shirt <laughs> 
But um, I know that Tusker also work in uh, to help conservation of pangolins. They're one of the most uh, trafficked animals in Africa because they're hugely popular, not just from um, a potential um, uh, Asian medicine perspective for the scales, but also the meat is seen as a delicacy. And I, you know, I think it. I think it's one of the most trafficked animals. But it is. It what, is. What's it is. happening? It's, it's actually it? believed to be. Yeah, it is believed to be the world's most trafficked. The world's most animals. Um, do you know the extraordinary thing about pangolin? I mean, they're a wonderful creature. Um, is that you know I've been incredibly fortunate, obviously, to travel to Africa. You know, now for nearly forty years, which is showing my age, um, and. I've never seen a pangolin myself in the wild. Um, so it, it, I'm always flummoxed by the, the scale of trade in this species mm. um, because you just don't see you them. You don't see them. You know, they're nocturnal, basically mm -hmm. nocturnal animal. Um, and um, it is been, it, they, they reckon that over a million pangolin have been poached out of Africa over the last 10 or so years. Yeah. Um, and they are also found in Asia. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess that's where the market first, you know, arose from. And it is, I find it, I find it really difficult to get my head around why, you know, these markets exist. I mean, the meat, I suppose mm -hmm. you can understand. Um, but... The scale, the, the scales that are on the pangolin, mm -hmm. which is the most traded element of it, um, is made of keratin. It's the same as a rhino horn. It's yep. the same as your fingernail. And yet, uh, you know, traditional Chinese medicine, Far Eastern medicine, has this myth that keratin from these scales or from rhino horn has some sort of magical medical power it doesn't no there's absolutely no proof whatsoever um and in the case of the pangolin the scale is uh you know is believed to be able to help women to lactate and that's why it's consumed okay um amongst other things but that's mm. that's one of the one of the things so you know this poor creature which is you know the most wonderful wonderful animal and an important animal, you know, going back to what we were saying about ecosystems. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, it, 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 um, it, it eats, it survives on insects, mm -hmm. and it helps to regulate the population of insects in, in, you know, yeah. uh, within its habitat. So it's important. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's just terrifying the, the, the level that this trade has got to. Um, in China... Uh, the Chinese government introduced a ban. Yes. Supposedly. Yes. But unfortunately, they just simply haven't followed through with it. Okay. And so uh, <clears throat> you can still see online <clears throat> pangolin, you know, products being marketed online in openly China. Openly marketed. Openly marketed. So, so, you know, they made a big announcement about mm. this you know, some years ago, but it just simply hasn't followed through. So unfortunately, that hasn't had the impact on, you know, on the trade. I mean, interesting enough, you know, the, the Chinese government did introduce a domestic ban on the ivory trade. And that did have a huge impact. It, 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 uh, we saw a massive drop in the price in ivory, mm. um, which was really important and was a great success story for the conservation movement. But sadly, in the case of the pangolin and in, indeed rhino horn, and it's not yeah. just China, I should say. Vietnam is yeah. a very big market in this as well and other parts of, of Asia. Yeah, and I, and I know those changes came in in 2020, so hopefully it's just a time piece and that will start to to show in the future because as you said it's just from the research that i've been doing on pangolins that 
you know, they really are the forest eco warriors because one of the insects that they um, devour are termites. So it helps then the tree population and the wider That's biodiversity. Correct. So they're just magnificent. But also what's what's potentially even more worrying for me is that the scales are then being shipped out to America, as an example, and being used for boots, bags and belts. And mm. I don't know, I suppose it's, it's for me, it's just more shocking to go, okay, someone who's as, as westernised as America and, you know, meant to be forward-thinking, why are people still buying and investing in these products? It's ignorance, ultimately. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, the work that, you know, all of the conservation organisations do, you know, apart from supporting and funding the work on the ground, is, you know, we have to continue to raise awareness so that when mm. people are either traveling on holiday that they they you know they're aware of what they're buying mm. you know what is this product where does it come from you know and um, so that's really important actually some good news literally this morning uh, on breakfast news there was a story uh, about a significant um, illegal wildlife trade group, a, a trafficking group, mm -hmm. had been arrested. And they were one of the biggest suppliers of pangolin scales. So they've been taken down. Um, so that, you know, is some success. Well, that's a wonderful piece of news to share today of all days, which is fantastic. Hopefully that, that can continue. Um, and and more of this happens. And But... The, the TUS project, how are you then helping with conservation with pangolins? Is it back to those community projects again? And are, are you getting communities Yeah, so we've got, um, we've got two or three projects, which uh, are, but there's one particular one called the Pangolin Project, mm -hmm. um, uh, which uh, sort of says what it does. <laughs> yeah, you know, absolutely. It does. Um, <laughs> so that's based in Kenya. Yeah, uh, and primarily working in the Masai Mara, mm -hmm. uh, working to, um, well, d on several uh, several levels actually. One, there's there's still very little known about pangolins, mm -hmm. so we need to know more. We yeah. need the baseline data on them. Um, we need to uh, educate the rangers and and uh, game scouts on. Uh, you know, give them greater knowledge of pangolin so that they can protect them, you know, uh, better. And then we need to work with the communities that live alongside to explain to them how important the pangolin is as part of the overall ecosystem mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, uh, the, 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 the fact that they are in trouble. Uh, and, and so often, you know, a lot of what we see is, is, you know, if you can engage with those communities and if you can, as I said earlier, if you can demonstrate the value of the environment and the wildlife and the, you know, that, uh, you know, exists with them, um, then you can, you can start to get that support uh, and you can start to turn off the tap of poachers either coming from those communities or poachers moving through those communities mm -hmm. which often is what happens um is that you can you can you know you can create a sort of a layer of defense around the parks um uh, you know that's what we've seen with you know with the ivory trade and with mm -hmm. the rhinehorn trade and things like that so so it's it it is very much about increasing the understanding the awareness of this particular creature mm -hmm. um but we've got other projects in the gabon and um in Nigeria, uh, where and Nigeria is, is sadly a, a very significant source of uh, pangolin for this trade. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that incident this morning I just re yeah. you know, reported, you know, uh, was a Nigerian based, you know, trafficking ring. Mm -hmm. um, so um, and the good thing about that particular case, by the way, is that, is that you know, the the middlemen in who are, who are in the far east who are buying were also taken down as part of it good so not just at the source yeah. it was the chain exactly fantastic i as i said charlie i could talk about these projects all day but um do you want to just talk us through a couple of what's coming up next for for tusk we talked about the gorilla trail 
there's a Christmas challenge coming up. Yeah, so we uh, every year we um, we participate in an initiative called the Big Give, mm-hmm. and um, which uh, runs in November, um, and it's an opportunity whereby um, uh, people can donate whatever sum it is. It mm-hmm. could be five pounds, ten pounds, twenty pounds. It could be a thousand pounds. We don't mind, but it gets matched. Okay. 100% match. So whatever you give during the big give campaign uh, will have double the impact. Amazing. Um, and, uh, and that's uh, going to support, you know, all of our projects. Yeah. Um, and, um, but, uh, you know, the pangolin will certainly be a beneficiary yeah. uh, of, of that uh, yeah. Because am I right in thinking you've got over 40 projects, conservation projects going on at us? Yeah, so we have a core portfolio mm-hmm. uh, of uh, about 40 partners. Yeah. Uh, they're all grassroots organisations. Um, uh, so we don't, we don't own or manage any of the projects. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the, our philosophy has always been about trying to identify what we believe are the best practitioners implementing and having the greatest impact on the ground. And then we get behind them and support them. Uh, it's not just through funding. It's in, in a number of different ways. But um, So that's how the portfolio is created. Mm-hmm. And then beyond that portfolio, uh, we have the Tusk Conservation Awards, which we do every year, yep. which is an initiative we set up with Prince William, our patron, mm-hmm. um, where we shine a spotlight on what we believe are the unsung heroes of conservation in Africa, including you know, we have a Wildlife Ranger Award, uh, an Emerging Conservation Award, and and, uh, um, and that's something which we're very, very proud of, uh, you know, as, as an initiative. And it's, uh, uh, it's really um, been something that has really elevated the status of some of these individuals, not only within their own country, but also globally. And so mm-hmm. that's, that's been an important initiative. And then we've, for the last three years, um, this is the fourth year, actually, of it. Uh, we've we've run an initiative called the Wildlife Ranger Challenge, mm-hmm. um, and that was instigated during COVID. Okay. Because, uh, like everybody else in the world, you know, it all came to a grinding halt. Yes. Tourism came to a grinding halt, and as a re- and because tourism in Africa underpins so much of the employment of the rangers. Yep we very quickly found that rangers were being made redundant, losing their jobs and their livelihoods. We had this um, incredible philanthropist called Mark Scheinberg who came out of the blue and put up a matched fund uh, to uh, support rangers in 2020. And we created this challenge Mm -hmm. uh, whereby to, uh, as a vehicle to to raise money um, so that it was going to be matched like the big give campaign 100 percent um and remarkably that year in 2020 in in spite of covid we raised 10 million dollars to support nearly 10,000 rangers and keep them on the front line working uh so that they didn't lose their jobs Mm. but what happened is is that uh the core element of that challenge was was we invited rangers all over africa to run a half marathon with 22 kgs on their back, wow. which is their normal backpack. Yeah. Um, and we asked them to take part in this half marathon. And um, and they loved it. They absolutely loved it. And they were, of course, because of COVID, they were running virtually within their own protected areas. Yeah. Um, um, so in 2021, we, we still had the, the, the issues of COVID. So um, Mark Scheinberg put up a fund again, and we did it again, and then we did it in uh, uh, 2022, and and now this year as well, we're doing it again. So so it's, uh, you know, over the last three years, we've raised uh, over $16 million for Rangers. Uh, And although we've now come out of COVID, Mm. you know, through this initiative, what it really demonstrated is how there was a real need to really support the rangers, uh, ranger sector to professionalise them, improve the, uh, you know, the the living standards. So many of them are so 
badly paid, badly trained, badly equipped, um, and have a you know really rudimentary living quarters. So this this wildlife ranger challenge is really all about trying to lift those rangers up in in every sense and to professionalise that sector. Um, so that's something that uh, you know sits beyond the portfolio of projects that we yeah. have. And one of the other challenges as well is your canine challenge, which might be quite interesting to, to a lot of our listeners. Do you want to talk a little bit more about what is the canine challenge? How did that come about? Yes, yeah, so the canine challenge is part of the wildlife ranger challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, as some of your listeners will be aware, um, that uh, ranger groups are increasingly seeing the, the benefits and the power of, of, have, of using dogs in tracking poachers. Mm -hmm. Um, and they, the different breeds of dogs have been used for, you know, different, you know, so so bloodhounds, for instance, incredible nose on them, um, and then you've got other, uh, the Belgian Malinois, uh, as also, and then crossbreeding as well, yeah. um, has um, allowed some of these range of teams to create incredibly effective uh, anti poaching, um, you know, uh, teams. Um, and so as part of the Wildlife Ranger Challenge, we decided that we would create a challenge for those canine teams. Amazing. And uh, so uh, they were set a, um, a, a, a series of challenges that they had to video um, and then they were judged on that. And, and we hope that that canine challenge will grow yep. uh, over, over the coming, coming years. Amazing. And as I said, Charlie, I could literally talk all day, but I think we're going to have to start wrapping it up. But uh, two last questions for you. The first one is, if there's one thing that you want listeners to take away today, what is that key bit of information about the animals that you help to protect? What is it that you really want them to take away with them today? I think the key thing is, is we... You know, we, we all lead incredibly busy, hectic lives. You know, our attention span has gone down to zero. <laughs> um, but we mustn't forget that, you know, we live on this planet. We share this planet with so many species. Mm -hmm. And our own future existence on this planet relies on the whole of uh, the planet's biodiversity existing. We therefore have to, you know, treat nature in all its guises, including all of the species that live on this planet, with far greater care and attention than we currently do. Um, and as I said earlier, that, you know, when we travel, you know, just to be really mindful of, of the products that mm -hmm. might be offered for sale, you know, um, educate ourselves on, you know, what is going on in terms of the conservation world, um, in terms of the illegal wildlife trade uh, and, and the environment and, 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 and how it works within different cultures. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's ultimately what we have to do. But, but also, dare I say, please support organisations like Tusk in the efforts that we and our partners on the ground, you know, are, are trying to deliver. It's, yeah. It is crucial. Couldn't agree more. Just one final one. What has been, and I know this one's probably going to be the most challenging question, but what has been your most proudest achievement at Tusk to date? Gosh. <laughs> There's a fair you few know, years to look uh, back over. You know, we've got so many amazing projects mm -hmm. that are doing incredible work. Um, and the Tusk Conservation Awards tries to highlight not just our our partners, but actually, you know, uh, people who who are supported by other organisations as well. And and uh, um, but in terms of Tusk, I, I'm proud that you know since we set up the organisation, we've raised now over 120 million pounds uh, yeah. invested into into the field. Um, but I think it's that. Um, how we have really helped to create a movement of community-driven conservation. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, 
I keep going back to the need to hang on to landscape and, mm-hmm. and habitat and, and how much wildlife exists outside national parks. We cannot just rely on national parks. Yeah. And so, um, you know, the success of these community conservation areas is, is something that, you know, I'm very proud that we recognize and that we've been able to invest in and to support those organizations to develop and to roll out, you know, such an incredible um, number of, of community, you know, conservancies. Yep. I think just to wrap that up, incredible is a word that I would use to describe Tusk and the work that you do. So thank you so much for coming for a walk in the park today with Animal Friends. It has been a pleasure to meet with you and discuss all these topics. And I hope in the future we can get you back. Thank you. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. And we are so grateful for the support that Animal Friends has given us over so so many years. And long may that continue, I hope. Absolutely. Thanks again, Charlie. It's been amazing. Thank you to all of our listeners. You can find out news about our podcast on our Instagram or TikTok handles, which is at Animal Friends Insurance, or on our Facebook page at Animal Friends Pet Insurance.